you hear me? Turn it up, turn it up kind of low. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I hear you. <laughs> You ever, ever, like, with somebody, when you text somebody and they don't respond? I like don't to, text, wouldn't, so I don't know. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you like to be able to reach in there somehow and turn the volume up and say, hey. <laughs> I'm trying to send you a message. Hello. You know. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you don't close that to the sirens go off. They won't last as long. Well, that's a bunch of them went off. Yeah, I suppose the two of them went off. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Person. No, they go to your place, right? So, right? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> if it did, they were making they got it the message for you. Right? Good, uh, yes. Naya, would you be so kind as to pray for us to start it? Would you please? Get, they get online, and it's really neat. That's where I get the big numbers from. 
But in lieu of something I said last night, I recognize that there are some things that Melchizedek does. Melchizedek, if you don't know who I'm speaking of, Melchizedek was the guy that Abram, before he became Abraham, he, he, his, his nephew Lot got kidnapped, his whole family. And so Lot and then got taken prisoner by this certain king. I'll call him Chaz, to be sure. He's got a big old name, but just Chaz. We'll call him Chaz. And old Chaz, you know, he got involved and took over that city. And then when he took over the city, he decided he was going to take over the people. And so he confiscated everybody in the spoils of war, which was the people and their things that they owned, their cattle, their sheep, all of that stuff, all their spoils, took all their jewelry, took all their gold, did anything of wealth, took all of that. Most of the times back then, if you had more than three cows, you were wealthy, okay? So, <laughs> and if you had, you know, more than three or four sheep, you were wealthy, right? But if you had, like, herds of sheep and herds of cattle, you were, you know, you you were Donald Trump, right? And that's, you know, that's who he is. So, but Lot was a very wealthy man. And when Lot got took over, when Lot's family, and Lot and his herds and his, all, his, all his possessions got taken by that king, or Abram, which becomes Abraham, wasn't going to have none of that. And he wasn't going to be played with either. So Abraham goes, or Abram at the time, goes and defeats old Chad. Wears him out. Tears him up. And then he comes and brings Lot and the family back to the land of Canaan, which happens to be in this place called Salem, which eventually becomes Jerusalem down the line. All right? That's just a quick history lesson. That's Abram Melchizedek 101. Now, something that happened last night that I got to thinking about while I was giving the message. What about those people who go through things and it was unexpected? Like, what about Lot? Think of yourself as Lot for a minute. Lot is a guy who has a family. This king comes in, takes you over, kidnaps you, you and your family, everything you possess, and now you have nothing and you are now the, the they own you. You, you, you are not your own person. What happens to him? What happens to that person who faces struggles and stresses and trials and it seems like life is unfair? When you seem like you just, why me? Well, how come I, why do I have to go through this? For what reason am I, what purpose does this even serve that I have to suffer this way? Everybody goes through that. Everybody. I don't care who you are. You, you, you may have it all together, or you think you do. And I guarantee you some kind of tragedy, some kind of trial come your way, some misfortune happened in your life. I guarantee you that one of the questions that come out of your brain is why. Why this? I've got this song and this video playing up here for a reason. I'm going to make a statement, and I want you to really hear me, okay? Uh oh I guess he wants me to be here. There it is. Smooth seas, hear me. A calm ocean, a smooth sea will never make a skilled sailor. Let me say that again. Smooth seas cannot make a skilled sailor. It takes rough seas to make sailors skillful. It takes turbulent times to cause them to know how to navigate through a storm. And so as they gain their experience, when the greenhorns come on board and they meet their storm for the first time, and their first result is to panic, the skilled sailor and come beside them and help them see the reality of what it is because they live on something called the other side of three. And there is something on the other side of three. 
Okay? So, that all being said, I'm going to talk to you today about what it is to be a skilled sailor. Rough oceans. You cannot gain wisdom, Wanda. You cannot know how, unless you experience what it is to burn your spaghetti or burn your tomato sauce or maybe overcook your cake or whatever the case. And somebody, some young girl coming to play and they're trying to learn and then all of a sudden you say, and you know something, Miranda cooked me a, a waffle tonight. She cooked me this vegetable soup. Y'all think what y'all want to. I am a simple man. Vegetable soup will just, that'll just do for me like you will not believe. Especially if you put a little cornbread with it. I'm just, I am, I could just like climb into bed and say, that's it. See y'all later. I don't want to talk more about it. Okay? But the, the thing of it is, is that the, these things that we experience are simple things that we experience, and they are tough things that we experience. Okay? It's interesting how the, the most simplest thing can become the greatest thing. And yet the greatest thing can become the most simplest thing. But all of that is done through experience. We cannot know what it takes to deal with the storm if we've never went through the storm. Why are you going through the hell that you go through? It's real simple. God's going to teach you something because there's somebody else needs the experience that you're going to get. Right. So we're going to talk about the, the reality of storms today. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, I want to read this to you. And chapter 43, okay, electronics, everybody, turn it here. Turn it, we, we go fast. We're, we're going fast. We go fast. Okay. Chapter 43, Isaiah reads this. But now, thus says the Lord, your Creator, O Jacob, and He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Isn't it interesting? The very first thing that He says, Isaiah says, the reality of where you are. He's making sure you stay focused on exactly the place that's where you are supposed to be at. You're God. You belong to God. You belong to Him. You belong to Him. You are God's. He created you. You belong to Him. Isaiah brings that to the very forefront. When you pass through the waters, verse 2, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, you are honored, and I love you. Who is it that just wants to hear God just tell you he loves you? Mm. I will give men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. And I will say to the north, don't give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Amen. Isaiah starts out the reality of recognizing who you are and whose you are. He brings you to the forefront of recognizing before you ever recognize the storm that you're in, you can recognize who you belong to. Because it just so happens the storm also belongs to God. So everything belongs to God. Now, today, I want to give you some encouragement in your walk in faith as a believer. I want you, when you find yourself in the storms of life, I want you to be able to Pull out of your memory box today's message and, and re reminisce it in the storm that you're facing. The raging storms of the seas that we encounter, they challenge us, they try us, they tribulate us, 
But all of that is because it's a journey of faith. We don't need to fear, according to what Isaiah said. We don't need to fear. Our faith in God can become an anchor. Your faith in God can become your compass. Your faith in God can become a guiding light, even though there's darkness that's all around you. And it's without a doubt that life can bring a raging storm, tossing you about all over the treacherous seas. But even in the midst of those tempests, God is with us. Calm seas never make skilled sailors. In times of distress, it's natural to feel overwhelmed, to question why these storms have come upon you. But let me remind you of a fundamental truth that calm seas do not make skilled sailors. So there's a reason for you to be going through what you're going through. The storms that we face, they're used by God to shape us. They're used to strengthen us and to deepen our faith. Now, it's through adversity that we truly learn who we are and who God is. It's in those times of trials and those times of adversity that, that we naturally feel overwhelmed. But isn't it amazing that whenever you come to face some major tragic thing that could hit you straight on, the car pull out in front of you going down the road, a truck swerved in the wrong lane heading your way, what is the first thing that usually comes out your mouth? Oh God, oh Lord, well you're on a good start, that's a good start to be at, because that is the truth, that is the truancy of your soul inside you calling out to the only one that can make a difference. When that 18-wheeler is heading your direction in your lane, 55 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, you've got milliseconds before something can change, including the end of your life. You could swerve quickly, left to right, and you only make that car maneuver to a way that becomes a, a brick facing the truck heading you straight on. You ever seen a video where a car gets hit by a truck? I have. The car explodes. It just explodes in a million different pieces. If that's the metal of that car, what do you think your body, your flesh is going to do? These are moments that our soul is reaching out to something, and you say it. You may be the most anti-religious person, or you may be the most anti-Christian person, even if you do not believe in God. You come to that moment, I guarantee you, something's going to come out your mouth sounds like, oh God, or oh Lord. And if you look out throughout the Bible, you can find all kinds of things that we see is a reality here. We can see the things, the stories of men and women that have taken place before us that we can recognize endurance. Talking about an ocean, think about Noah. Noah endured a flood. Noah endured God raising the oceans to the point, by the way, in fact, that by that time, there hadn't even been so much as this rain. Because the Bible says when the, that day, when that rain came, the rain came from the ground. It came up. It didn't come down. It went up. It came back down. But the Bible talks about how the waters came, came from up the earth. God brought the oceans up and all because of evil that was in the world. God looked to destroy the evil. And he did it by water. If you think about it, you think about Noah when he endured the flood. All the people outside that ark is not going to make it. Him and his family is the only ones that's going to go through the storm. Joseph. Joseph faced a betrayal. Remember him? Joseph who had all those three different coats. Remember the coat that his daddy gave him? The coat that Potiphar gave him? And the coat that the king gave him? Three coats. I would love to talk to you guys about threes. There's so many threes in the Bible. It's amazing. If you stick with me in the study of Hebrews, you'll see. Now, 
Joseph, he faced betrayal. His own family, his own brothers, sold him into slavery. You know what's amazing about that whole idea? Is that who Joseph got sold into the hands of? It's amazing to watch this story because Joseph was sold into the hands of the Ishmaelites. Ishmael was the kid that was not in the promise. But Ishmael got kicked out. Ishmael went through his story and later on his descendants would cause Joseph to be purchased by him, who ended up all the way up to the second in command of Egypt. Wow. Don't throw away Ishmael. You never know what's coming down the pipe. All right? There's all Job. Everybody wants to talk about Job, right? How he, what he experienced. All he lost. He lost everything. Lost all his kids. Trinity. Job lost everybody except his wife. And his wife, all she would do is, why don't you just curse God and die? That's all. That's what she kept telling him. Why don't you just curse God and just die? Just roll up your feet and forget about it. Hurry up, get it over with. What? Job never did that. Job suffered physically. He lost his kids. He lost everything he owned. He never lost his wife. And his wife wasn't the best in the world. He didn't lose her. Some things that you want to lose, you can't. I'm just going to put that out there for what it's worth. I mean, there are just some things out there in this whole world I could just do without. You know what I'm saying? But I still get to struggle through it. I got one person on my job. Lord God knows it. That woman. Mm, that woman. Woo! Bless her heart and all her bottom organs. And you hear me? I mean, I'm trying to be nice here. But that gal will work. She tries my Jesus every day, Monday through Friday. Just to let you know, from the time I get on the board to the time I get out of there, that woman try my Jesus. And I... I have been known to get real close to them. They have to say, don't, don't say a few words, go back, you know what? I'm telling you, there are people in this world who will just try your nerves. They're out there. You suffer through those things. We all do. You know, when you think about Noah for just a minute. Adam to Noah. Just, just, just for a minute. There had only been 1,665 years from the time of Adam to when Noah was there. 1,665 years. Well, that sounds like a lot because we don't live past 70, 80, 90 years, right? Some of us 100. But, you know, Adam, Adam lived how many years? 900 plus. He lived 900 plus years. Now, you consider, here's something that's really impressive to me. 1,665 years from Adam to Noah. Ten generations. Some of them lived 70 years, some of them lived 800 years, some of them lived 900 years. Do you honestly think that those ten men recorded in those generations were the only ones that lived that long? There's more people that had to live that long. Okay? They refused. Those people refused God. But when Adam died, check this out. When Adam died, only 216 years passed when Noah was born. That's it. N Noah had to be told about Adam. Only 1,665 years, and these cats were living 8 to 900 years. So you know somebody, Methuselah. Check this out. Methuselah? was alive when the floods came. It's hard for us to fathom this. But these, these are the realities of that world. Now, something happened so terrible that it made God seek to destroy the earth. And he did so with flood, with water. And we can go through the process of a, of a rainbow, which happens is a promise to the earth. It's a promise to Noah and the Noah uh, uh, commitment, or what we what we would call the, the the covenant of Noah. And Noah's covenant that he made was made with the earth. And so when the rainbow comes to play, 
It's a promise that God makes to mankind that he will not destroy the earth by water again. It ain't got nothing to do with your identity. It's got everything to do with the reality that God made a promise that he would not destroy it by water. He didn't say he wouldn't destroy it by fire, because that's exactly what they'll do. But that's another story. So, obviously, there is something that takes place in that process of that world that causes God to destroy the earth. But we find the reality of what Noah does and what he experiences later on in the New Testament. Would it, would it surprise you to know that Noah is made mention of a few times in the New Testament? A couple of places in the Gospel? And one time in Hebrews, listen to what it says. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, talking about the flood, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness which is according to faith. Righteousness is according to faith. God is righteous. We are not righteous. There is not a righteous bone in my body. My body is corrupt. It's got problems. It will die. This body is going to finally kick it in. Kick the bucket. Exit stage center. Whatever the case, whatever you want to call it. The reality is that everybody's going to die. It's what happens after that is what you need to be concerned about. And you're given a lifetime, your life. To prepare for that moment in time. When time ends and everlasting begins. You're given opportunity to reach up with something called faith that God gives everybody. Everybody has faith. Let me ask you this question. You ever seen a baby not drink from the nipple, from the bottle? You ever seen a baby not do it? Like, no, I don't want it. You, you ever seen a little too much of it? They say, I don't want it. No! You ever, ladies and babies get full. You ever seen a baby who didn't know how to drink from the bottle? Now, there are some medical things that we know exist in the world that are things that cannot help, right? But naturally, you know how a, a newborn baby knows how to, how to latch on. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. That was down for a word. But the whole gist is that we see something in us because that, does the baby expect the nourishment when it latches on? Yes. yes. Let me ask you this question. When you're in a dire situation and that truck is heading you head on and you cry out, oh God, is your soul trying to latch on to something that knows it's there? See, only your your mind is what plays havoc with you. You know who your enemy is? You know who my enemy is? Let me tell you who John is. Number one enemy of John. You'd like to know who that is? Ain't got nothing to do with the devil. You got everything to do with John. I am my own worst enemy. I am my own worst critic too. I am also the one who knows when it feels the greatest and feels the best. I'm also the one who the vegetable soup was to be amazed by. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, only we are our own enemy. Our enemy is us. So the next time you look at yourself in the mirror, recognize that critter, that booger, has got some problems. And you get to walk it out with that booger that you see in the mirror every day of your life. So when you're having a bad hair day, only you know it. Well, some of us may know it too, but the point is, is that you know it. Because you looked in the mirror and you had to say, oh, oh, I was having a hair day breakdown this morning myself. I just, it was just, you know, it just wasn't happening. So all of us have moments and trials and situations that we go through. The story of Noah, to understand where the wickedness come from, is seen in Genesis. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, of that man, was only evil continually. The Bible talks back way back in the very first chapter of Genesis, where God said that he saw everything that he made and it was good. 
So from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 6, we got that. In fact, from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 6 is 1,665 years. Just to kind of put you to understand what the reality of that is. We can see that God saw things were good, right? But there's some other factors that came in to play, which is evil on every man's heart. It's a cruel way to live. But most people live just day by day, minute by minute. They don't make plans for tomorrow. You can plan for tomorrow, and you can think about yesterday. But the truth is, the only time that you do have is now. now you, if we live moment by moment, in other words, some people, the old saying is paycheck to paycheck. You ever heard that old slogan? We live paycheck to paycheck. What does that mean? That means, you, you, what you, let, me, let me tell you something that God taught me. God taught me how to hear what people say, don't say louder than what they really do say. To hear what they didn't say, which is louder than what they did say. So when somebody is saying, I'm living paycheck to paycheck, you're saying that you're living without hope. You're saying that you cannot live beyond the measure what you can inundate yourself to live. You're only going to live till next week. Friday. That's it. Saturday morning you date it. Because you're going to spend all your bill on Friday night. You can go and hit the you're gonna go out and hit the bar, you're gonna go hit the club, you know, some of y'all, some of y'all, somebody gonna go hit the club, some of y'all. Some of y'all gonna go out to this big fancy restaurant, take half your paycheck, and just on one go. For you just to experience what? 30 minutes of being full. Because your digestive tract already started in 30 minutes, so you're only getting about 30 minutes worth. Think about it. The people live this way. They live paycheck to paycheck. They live from this moment to that moment to the next moment to the next moment. They don't have, they don't, they're not living for now. When I say living for now, I'm talking about living in the reality of God for right now. I love what Matthew says about Noah. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood. When it say when? When it say? The days when? Y'all with me? Do I need to reread? <laughs> but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood. When? Before when? Before what days of what flood? When God destroyed the earth, right? The water. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will come the coming of the Son of Man be. Notice it says that they were marrying and giving in marriage. By the way, that phrase given in marriage or given into marriage or given in marriage, that phrase is to pretend in something that is not natural. It is natural for a man to be with a woman. It is natural for a husband to find a wife. A, a wife to find a husband. It is right. The problem comes when a man does not lay with a woman, but lays with another man, or a woman lays with another woman. The given in marriage. Pretending in something that was not designed for marriage. Isn't it very interesting when you talk about marriage, we talked about marriage a minute ago, when we talk about marriage, that marriage is, the, is one of the human covenants that God created when he says a man shall leave his mother and his father. But Adam did not have a mother and father. Yet he tells, God says, an establishment of a truth. That's what merit and cling to his wife. There, this is the reality of what and God instituted as marriage. When the husband and wife that become man and woman becomes one, not a man and a man. That's given in marriage. That phrase, there were some wrong things going on before Noah got saved from that flood. In fact, that gets repeated a little bit later on when we see Sodom and Gomorrah go on. The same thing takes place again. Is it funny how if God cleaned the planet? And only Noah and his family survived. 
that was the righteousness. The Hebrew says that's the righteousness. If that's the case, here's my question. Where did evil come from? How did evil get on that boat? Yeah. If all those evil people got destroyed, then how did evil get on the boat? The Bible says it's, it's the heart of man that's wicked. Noah might have looked good on the outside, but inwardly he was still just jacked up just like the rest of us. Okay? And his kids were jacked up too. And they went around and messed around and you see any Noah hadn't even died yet, and his kids already got on stupid. You, you cannot escape the reality of where sin resides. Here. The, the, the heart of man is ultimately wicked. Who could know what the Bible says? God often uses things of nature to, to, to bring about to us what it is that God is doing for us. Let me talk about this real quick. God uses nature to communicate judgment. The scripture indicates that God has often used nature to judge humankind. For example, God, who by the way is sovereign, over his creation, used the waters of the Red Sea to save the Israelites and destroy the Egyptians. God uses nature to judge. God is seeking to cleanse the earth. By the way, what are we made from? Dust. Dust. The earth. God seeking to cleanse us, ultimately. Our flesh is made from the dirt. By the way, what did when God was handing out them curses, I don't know if you happen to notice this, when he cursed the devil, what did he curse the devil with? What was the devil's curse? Anybody want to take a gap? Hmm? What? All day, day from right. So the reality, now here, there. That is, that is the culmination of a cursing that God handed out. God cursed the devil. God cursed him that he would eat dust. What are we made from? Dust. Dust represents flesh. The devil will eat the flesh that you provide him. If you provide enough flesh for him, he will feast and be a buffet for that devil. Okay? And when he was handed out curses, he looked to a woman and gave her one too. What was her curse? He cursed a woman. What did he curse her? The pain in childbearing, right? Well, let me, I have never birthed a child, so I do not know. But it looks quite painful to me. I mean, I it just, I just got to, if it was left up to me, the human race doesn't stop right here. That's as far as it goes. I ain't doing that. I ain't going to do it, no. The, but women have this thing they have to endure. Childbirth. And it's not an easy road. You, it says to go further, it says that through childbirth she will be saved. Through her child, right. So, thank you, because you could bring me to my next point. Because that's exactly what happens through the troubles and trials that we face. The rough seas that we go through, something comes on the other side of through. Because on the other side of through, with that woman who happens to be the church, the bride, comes from the side, comes a... a church from his side and he was stabbed in the side. The Bible says blood and water flowed out. I, I, I would love to talk to you about how how the, the anatomy of a woman and when, you, when you look on the anatomy of a woman you see the reality of what it is God does to bring about the church. You know it's interesting that God Jesus Christ was on that cross for nine hours. How many months do you girls take to to Nine, isn't that interesting? And when you're when something breaks, what comes out? Blood and water. Blood and water. Isn't it interesting that blood and water come out of his side? And what came out of his side was the reality of a washing, which came out about as a church. We came out of that. Because just fifty days later, actually sixty days, but fifty days after the Pentecost, we, we find that taking place, and we will see the birthing of a church take place. And it's birthed by blood and water. Sealed by the blood of the Lamb. 
washed by the water of the renewing by the word. All of these things, are, there's, there's real significance here. I, I don't want to go there. Let me, let me continue on. The psalmist says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. He is ever-present. God is always present to help us when we're in trouble. How many here have been in trouble? Anybody been in trouble? I can't raise my feet. I get it all up here. Been in trouble. Everybody been in trouble. I guarantee you. Let me go ask your mom and daddy if you've been in trouble before. We'll find out if you've been in trouble. We'll, we'll, we'll get the truth here in a minute. So you should take comfort knowing that God's with you at all times when you are in trouble. Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But the opposite of that is true as well. I can't do anything without Christ. I cannot succeed if I don't have Him. And then I want to talk about one more storm that often gets overlooked, but it's preached an awful lot. And it's a storm where Jesus is asleep in a boat. And the storm shows up. And then boys who have been walking with him for quite a long time now, probably approximately two years, we're talking about they lived with him. They slept on the same ground, same place wherever they went. They ate, they prepared food together, they, they lived together. They're comrades. They were constituents. They were, they were ones who were dedicated to the one they called Master, Jesus. And he's asleep in this boat. And this storm comes. The storm that rages. How in the world? Anybody been on a, on a I've been on a deep sea fishing trip out in Panama, out in the Gulf of Mexico, out there. And there's something when you fight a, about an 18 foot wave through the night. And that boat is doing all these kind of numbers. You and that. Because they're, they're taking you out about 200 nautical miles off the coast of Panama City. And they're going to take you on a fishing expedition. And you've got this, that you're doing all this throughout the night to get there. Just so you can go deep sea fishing. All right? And I remember my, my cousin and I were, were, were on this boat with my grand, our grandfather. And grandfather, he was an old Navy guy. So he's used to these big ocean waves and thing was going on. That storm was nothing to him. He slept like you could hear my grandfather snore. My cousin and I were on the deck, above, up on the deck, sick. I bet we were green. I, I guarantee you there was a different color to our face besides white. Right? We were awful. So we are on this boat, and you could hear my grandfather down below snoring. It didn't bother him at all. That storm was fine. There's no big deal with him. But he's no Navy guy. Right? He, 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 he lived through the war dealing with, you know, he was a, he was what they call a bomber pilot. He was what they call a boomerang pilot. He was on a destroyer. If you look at some of the boat destroyer planes or boats and crafts, you would see these ships would have a plane look like it's sitting on this catapult. And they would turn that destroyer in the wind and they would have to time it just right when, when, the, when the ship rose up and off the top of the wave that they were slingshot my grandfather in that plane out there. Because if he was down here in this slingshot, guess what happened to him? They, so they got to do it. And he doesn't have control of it. Only the guy down below him who has a trigger, who's going to trigger him when they see just when it's the right time to launch him out so he can get airborne. And they'll turn that destroyer into the wind. And it'll be storming that, that those waves. And they'll, just as soon as he gets right about there, that's when he'll pull him, pull that trigger him. He'll catapult out and fly. My grandfather said he never flew the same plane twice. Because every time they try to winch it back up onto the cradle, the, 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 the waves would toss it and the wings would hit the side of the, the ship and break the wings off so they had to come and bring another plane. He never flew the same plane twice. But when we were on that deep sea fishing trip, my grandfather, down below, saw and logs. You could hear my grandfather over the shore. Are you hearing it? That's how loud that man snored. My cousin and I, we ain't wanting to snore. We want to 
Pepto Bismol by this time is not doing nothing for us. I mean, nothing's happening. We are bound for being sick. My grandfather gets up. Oh, how'd y'all boys sleep? We didn't sleep. Oh, we sick all night. I mean, grandpa's. Yeah, let's get some fishing going. The last thing I want to see is a bunch of dead squid. I'm fixing to have to put on a hook. You know, that's the last thing I want to see. But Granddad, he's like he's pulling up all this squid and just latching it on it. Here, John, check it out. This is what we're fishing with. I mean, I don't want, I don't want none of that. I'm faced with a storm, aren't I? I'm dealing with a storm, sickness. <laughs> Dead squid in my face. I mean, you know, this this is the this is my day. And we're supposed to be out here having a good time. And my cousin Dave and I, we sick. We are just sick. My grandpa, who has the experience of a skilled sailor, tells us to go do something. What would you think you tell us to do? What would you, as a as a, as a female, would you not want to com have compassion for your kid? Your grandchild, your child, and you know, maybe bring a soothing, you know, tourniquet for them, something to make them, maybe just something to help them get easier or whatever, make them feel better. Don't you want to make them feel better? My grandfather, in his way of getting feel better, ain't your way of getting feel better. <laughs> Granddaddy's way of getting feel better, he looked at me and Davey and told us, you boys go back to the back of the boat, and we were trudging, we were going across this, this Gulf of Mexico, just trudging along. He said, I want you boys to look down at them waves and just stare. I just want you to look down at the waves and stare. Okay. So David and I went back there and looked down in that water. It didn't take but a minute. It didn't even take that. Boy. I mean, you know, the, the fish was getting something besides swim that water. I guarantee you, it was hard. But that remedied us. We got better and quick. Now, where do you think my grandfather got that information from? How many years did he spend on a ship? Who told him to go to back of the boat and look down the water? I love what Isaiah says. Isaiah talks about when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sleep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. When Jesus is in that boat, all them other boys are worried about their lives. They're worried about what's going to happen next, how they're going to live. But to the point that they reach up to him, wake him up, and ask him a question. It wasn't, um, you know, are you okay? Are you laying there asleep? Are you dead? Did you... Are you zonked out? Did you take a sleeping pill and you just can't wake up? You got, are you on a binge or high? I mean, what's wrong? No, there's nothing that I'm not asking any other question. He said, don't you care that we die? You going to lay there and sleep while we out here dying? Is all you going to do? But see, storms will steal the sailor. I can't help but think and wonder. The storm that he was on that boat experiencing reminded him of another time where he was hovering upon the face of the waters. I just wonder if his mind went back to Genesis where the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. That he was pondering what he did back then and how the creation took place on the kind of, of what he did in the movement of that water. Here he is now on this boat. And he gets awake and he's startled up. He gets woke up. Don't you care that we die? Are you just going to lay there and sleep while the rest of us die? Is that what you're going to do? And what's the first thing out of his mouth? Oh, you of little faith. The problem is, is that what we need to face storms with obviously has to do something with our faith. There's something about our faith that contradicts that storm. Can the storm, can you see it? 
Can you experience it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it physically? Can you feel it internally? Yes. So the storms that you face in life, can you see those storms? Can you experience those storms? Do you feel them too? Do you feel them outwardly? Do you feel them inwardly? The storms that rage in your world? The storms that really truly do happen? But how about the storm that you face that you didn't tell anybody about? What about that one? What about the storm that you that you found yourself in a position one time that Oh, I wish I'd just turned left in Albuquerque. Yeah. You ever been there? Yeah. And you just knew that you just you just know that what you're experiencing is because your decision that you made and nobody helped you make it but you, yourself, and I. All three of you did it. And now you're faced with the the, the recompense of, of, of this experience now that you're having to face. I wonder how often, how many times, it, it, it always makes me wonder when, when young children who act as adults and they experience things that they should wait until they're married in adulthood, and then something happens, and now another life is being brought into the world because of their experiences, the choices that they make. Or how about the person who drinks to the point that he wakes up, doesn't know where, the, where he's at, what he did, how he got there, what, how many people from their drugs that they've taken over through the night, they wake up the next day and they are experiencing withdrawals. The storms that we create, the storms that we face of our own creation, Let me ask you this question. Have you ever read the book of James? James says this. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. James. James writes to us of this thing that we should persevere, the trial that we face. So when we face our troubles, when we face our trials, we should treat them as opportunities. We should be able to navigate those storms that come our way. Every one of them. Because the psalmist, David, made a promise that God led him to write and say, he made the storm be still. Talk about God. And the waves of the sea were hushed. Have faith for just as God stilled the storm for his disciples, he will calm the storms in our lives. Joseph, Paul, Noah, Peter, thank you, Peter. There's not one person in that Bible that we could read that didn't face a storm at some point in their life. And they're given to us as examples that we can learn from. I can't help but what John, what he writes in his gospel message. He said, I have told you these things, and he's repeating what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Calm seas are nice. They're good. It's good to have a good life in front of you and that there's no trouble. There's no problem. I have never lived such a life. I don't know about you, but I've lived through hell most of my 58 years of my life. I was a mere two months old when my father took my mother and I. He was going to be a big rock and roll star. He was 
And he was good musician. Uh, there's no doubt about it. He only had one arm. And he could play a bass guitar like you've never seen. Amazing. Amazing. Terrible. And he was going to be a big star. He was actually playing for the Allman Brothers at one time. Until he tried to get Greg Allman to do some drugs. And Greg was very serious about anti-drugs. And fired by that. My dad's future, everything about what he did, what he could have faced, what he could have experienced, went down the tube. All because of drugs. All because of a choice. That's what I'm talking to you today about. A choices. When you face your trouble and trial, is it the choice that you made? If not, then somebody made the choice for you. And if it was someone who made the choice for you, it means that you let them make the choice because you couldn't make the choice yourself. Still boils down to a choice. And when it comes to the reality of serving God, the same thing is true. It's a choice. It's a choice that you make. A choice that I make. So when my father was, had, when I was two months old, my father made a choice to take my mother and I to Florida, where he was going to be a big rock and roll star. When he got as far as Atlanta, Georgia, from Chattanooga, Tennessee, where my his aunt and uncle, my great aunt and uncle, who are now passed on, where they lived in a big fancy home, my, grand, my father decided that I guess that I and my mother was going to just cram his style. And so he left and abandoned my mother and I with his aunt and uncle in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, I'm two months old. You think I was given the right to choose? No. That's because I'm not 12 yet. I'm not at the age of accountability yet. So I depend on my mother. And my mother went with him thinking that she was going to have a life. And chose and found out that that was not going to be the life she was going to get to have. So my grandfather, my mother's mother, Left Chattanooga after my mother struggled for about two weeks to try to get a hold of it. There was no cell there was no cell phones. I mean, you know, just pick up the phone and die. And when she finally got in touch with my grandfather, her mother and her daddy, her daddy got in the vehicle, drove down to Atlanta, picked us up, and brought us home. And from that day on, I never left my grandparents' home. That became my home. My grandparents raised me, and I'm grateful. Not that my mother couldn't do it. It was just the fact that she had some problems in her life that she was trying to struggle through herself, choices she made. And at least she cared enough to make sure that I had a stable home. And my grandparents was that to me. They were my stable home. I lived in the same bed, same house, same street. If you knew where I where my street address is, like when I was that day, you know my password to everything I got in my whole world. Just so you know. I'm not worried about y'all finding that out because there ain't no way you'll figure that out. But I'm trying to tell you is that what we do in our lives, how we live our lives and the experiences that we made, had it not been for, you know what it's like? Maybe you do, you don't. <coughs> Trinity, you don't know this. Miranda may know this. Isn't it interesting that you can look to your parents? I, I didn't get a chance to find out the man who I thought was just a friend of the family. When I became eight years old, that was my actual dad. Eight. And I got siblings. And they experienced the same thing I've experienced. My father just wasn't a good father. He wasn't. But what my father did was that he lived a ruthless, selfish life. Going to be a big star. Rock and roll, man. Rock and roll. He loved his drugs. He loved his women. And he loved rock and roll. That was my dad. But on his deathbed, on his deathbed, now you think I had fun with my father growing up? You think that was fun for me to experience this guy? who when it came time for Christmas and he would come over and sit and eat with us, he'd be there long enough for him to eat and he'd leave. There would be no, there would be no relationship, no bond. 
And when I got older, and he's on his deathbed, and I'm sitting there with him, and he came out of a coma, he was having problems, his body was shutting down, he had renal failure, he had, he had organ failure, he had multiple organ failure, he was dying. And they said they could put him on a machine, he would live the rest of his days on that machine. And if he wanted to do it, that was his choice. And then I was given the, the role of being his spokesperson. I had the, the power of attorney, both medically and financially, and I had to make the choices for him. But I, when it came to that choice, I didn't want to make that one. So when my dad was up, well, he was sitting up in a chair, I got in front of him and I said, Dad, the time's come for you to make a decision, and I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this. But they can do nothing more for you. And you get to either live your life on a machine, and will live for you until they turn the machine off. Is that what you want? I'll do whatever you tell me to do, Dad. You tell me. And my dad looked at me and he said, no. I said, so you understand that if they don't put you on the machine, that's it. You've only got hours. I said, no, I don't want them. Okay. I told the doctor what the decision was, and they said, okay. So the next thing we're going to do is put him into a coma for him to die that way. And so for the next 45 minutes, I spent on my knees beside my father talking with him about God and the reality of what he was soon to experience heaven or hell. And the choice, again, was his. He gave his heart to the Lord that day. I know he did. I know he did. People would say, well, that's not a true confession. Well, you take that and your religion go wherever you want to do. If you can just, I can, I can rest assure you because my father said something after that. Before they, before they plunged that serum into his vein, he made them pause for a minute. And he looked to me into my face. He said, I want to thank you. I said, what for? He said, it should have been me to teach you how to be a father. But it was you who taught me how to be a dad. He said, you ready to go? He said, yep. He said, I'll see you soon. I'll be right behind you. He nodded his head. And when they, no more they plunged that in. My father went to a coma. It would just be hours later. I cried momentarily, and then it, I just, something, God just erected me and caused me to get a hold of myself. My faith rose to the occasion. And I had the main guy over the hospice of the hospital, the main doctor, the, he's, he's also the, the head um, minister of that group as well who this, this man came up to me and he took me to the side took me into this room he was in this little small room about, I don't know about as big as those two rows of chairs and looked at me and he said he was crying he, was, he had just lost it and he said to me he said you know I've experienced death more times than I'd like to admit I have watched families break down I've watched people who didn't break down, and I've watched it all. I've seen every kind of course of death and what people have experienced with death that I care to even make mention of. He said, but I want to tell you this. Of all the years I've been doing this, and I think he said he have been doing it for 30 years. He said, of all the years I've been doing this, I've never seen anyone like you to teach me what death and faith is. I've never seen that before. I've never seen anybody's faith rise to that case. I've never seen that in my life. You have a better grip on death than even I do. And I said, death is my servant. 
Death serves me. Death is the only one who can. Death is the only person, if you will, to call him a person or any person. Death is the only one who can take me to my Lord directly. And until I'm ready to go, death is my servant. He has to wait until I'm ready. And only God can tell me when I'm ready. All that has to do with faith. So when you're facing a storm in your life, a trial in your court, a storm that's kind of come at you, I want you to remember today's message. Remember what Isaiah said. He says, I will pour out water on you. For I will pour out water on the thirsty and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. And they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. And this one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. Another will write on his hand, belong to the Lord. And will name Israel and will name Israel's name with honor. God has the only one capable, the only one who has the ability to speak to the reality of all world and call things not as though they were and those things that were not as though they are. God is the only one who can. But when you pass through the waters, he says a promise, I will be with you. When you pass through those waters, those trials, those rough seas, just maybe hear the words of John L. Roberts, my grandfather. Just go to the back of the boat and look right straight down. You'll get past it. Because experience sometimes is worth more than any amount of gold possible. It's a wealth it's a wealth that helps you in every time of trial. Because when you go through and face the next thing again, and you're there, and you're dealing with that problem over again, you'll know, I am going to turn left in Albuquerque this time. I am not going that direction. Right? You good? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. God, I pray that just like you said to John to take heart because you've overcome the world, I pray, God, that your peace and your strength will come to every person in the sound of my voice and to help them understand that calm seas never make skilled sailors, but rough sea will skill a sailor. I thank you, Father, that you're able to do these things. You're capable. You're God. You're the creator of the universe, and you hold everything in the palm of your hand. And we give you praise, honor, and glory, because you're worthy to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen? You good? Yep. All right. We'll see. Let's see. We meet here again Thursday, by the way. And I guess we'll have Sam.